Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Reviewing Comics with me, your host, Alexander Turbin. This week we're going to be doing uh, Masters of the Universe. I'd like to show off some of my uh, animation cells that were used in the production of the show, I think, I hope. Um, I'm not sure how you can get these authenticated, so they may be real, they may not be real. I don't, I don't really know, but I don't care anyway. I think they're cool. This actually came uh, together. It was He-Man and Orko. And the background is just a, a photocopied um, picture of the background. which But I still think it's cool because I think animation cells are a great alternative to super expensive comic original comic book art. And that's why I, I originally started getting them. Um, you can still get X-Men um, animation cells. And I believe you can get them from authenticated places for maybe a hundred bucks or even less than a hundred bucks you could get a pretty good one uh which i've done a few of those so masters of the universe 1986 from marvel but before we get into that i'd like to show you some of my own comics this is random access which i produce on a monthly basis for my patreons you can get these at patreon.com backslash alexander turban and uh, it's a full-size full-color comic and i'm up to issue 17 now and like I said, you can get these on Patreon for just $2 uh, a month, which is a full-size, full-color, 12-page comic book. And this is the covers by Alex Daikaju. And um, every week I highlight a an indie comics creator on the back. Usually they have artwork in, my, in random access, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do. You can also get my stuff at alexanderturban.com. There's uh, all the random accesses. There's uh, Mutandus. There's all kinds of other older stuff that I've done in my comic making career. Or you could just uh, hit me up at AlexTurban0441 at Instagram. Um, so, Masters of the Universe from Marvel. Uh, this strays a little bit from what I usually do. This Is is this the first uh, uh, big um, comic from the, the big two? I uh, will have to look back, I guess. But I think it is that I, I've gone and I've gone and looked through. Um, so I'm going to judge it a little bit harsher than if it was just some somebody uh, producing their own comics, such as myself, or any of the other indie comics artists that uh, I'm friends with or know or appreciate their art. Because it's, it's a lot harder to do everything by yourself on your own. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This has... Um, you know, several people. It has editors. It has letterers. It has colorers. It has everybody doing. Um, they're focusing all on different things, so they can put a little bit more effort and a little bit more energy into doing these um, products. So um, it's it's held to a little bit of a higher standard, and it's also it's so mass produced that uh, there's so many out there that it just you know it goes without saying that I, I'm going to look at it with a, a little bit of a sterner eye than if I, I just looked at a, an indie comic. But, so here we go, 1986. I guess I had just watched a video on all of the different He-Man and Master of the Universe comics out there, and I think this is the second or third uh, comic by uh, for He-Man and Masters of the Universe. And... To be honest, I'm not really a Masters of the Universe fan. Um, I was 12, 13 when it first started coming out. And I remember I would go to school. But before I went to school, I would go to my friend's house. And they would be watching um, Masters of the Universe and or Scooby-Doo and or Star Blazers. So those were the three things that I would watch with my friend while they, him and his family got ready for school and ate their cereal and all that stuff. And really, Star Blazers is really the only one that I truly love out of all those. Scooby-Doo is, you know, it's an, an American icon, icon, and so you can't deny anything about that. But Masters of the Universe, <clears throat> I just could not really get into it. It was, um, the stories were just a little too simple for my, maybe for my age group, my age bracket. Um... But also it really, really, truly bothered me that they would reuse um, clips in the show. Like the, how many times in the show does He-Man run forward at the camera and then punch like three or four times? And then there's run, 
forward to the camera, uh, swapping his sword from hand to hand. So they would just reuse maybe seven minutes out of 20 on regurgitated animation cells. And that really, truly bothered me. So that's one of the reasons that I really was not into He-Man and Masters of the Universe. I keep calling it He-Man, Masters of the Universe. It's Masters of the Universe. But I mean, really, it's He-Man. He's, he's the king of the show. He's, he's, the, he's the man. He's the dude. Um, anyway, let's get into this reviewing this comic. Um, the Coming of Hordak. So I am not really knowledgeable or steeped in, in the knowledge of, um, of Masters of the Universe lore, uh, characters. I don't, I don't think I ever owned an action figure of He-Man. Um, this is probably the only things I have of He-Man are, are this and the animation cells. Um, but it starts with, um, Skeletor, which, you know, it is such a waste because Skeletor is such a great looking character. And actually so is He-Man. All of these characters are really cool looking, but then when you add them to their, um, their voices. I know that they didn't want Skeletor to be scary, and that's why they gave him a comical feel about him. But he he really could have been, you know, such a fantastic character if they'd given him a little bit more um, scariness and or and or depth. Uh, I guess they they learned their lesson or they decided differently when it came to Mumra and the Thundercats because Mumra he now he is a a badass looking character and a badass sounding character and he is a little lot scarier and and more in depth than Skeletor. I guess we would have to have a a, a battle of uh who you guys think is cooler, Skeletor or Mumra, but I'm definitely in the Mumra category. Anyway, let's get back to the review in the comic. And um so Skeletor is in his his chambers in his castle <coughs> and he's he's doing some kind of spell and he's, he's trying to get all of his powers together because he says somebody is coming back. And, um, so then they keep saying he's coming back and he has to, the only way he can keep the, uh, the evil guy back is by getting power from, pa from, uh, Castle Grayskull. And anybody out there want to, Clue me in as to why and how Castle Grayskull is so powerful and why Skeletor always wants to steal its power because um, I've never seen Castle Grayskull do anything. But I, I don't know. I don't even really remember the show. I remember it, it vaguely and I don't remember any specific parts. So he's in his, his castle or whatever and he comes up with this box of um, gloves. So... It cuts to um, what's her face, um, Zor, uh, the guardian of Grayskull, and she knows what magically. I I know it's a comic from a kid show, and maybe that's why I dislike the show because so many of these um, tropes happen in the show where characters just automatically know things without any kind of. Uh, foreknowledge or anything like that and that just uh, it moves the story along and all that and it's for kids but <clears throat> if it's not good it's not good and I don't know some people love Masters of the Universe so I'm not gonna crap on it at all because it's it's it is an American icon just like just like Scooby-Doo so anyway it's the it's the uh the witch from Grayskull, and she flies off to find He-Man. He-Man is uh, Adam, Prince Adam. And anybody notice that Prince Adam is friggin' jacked? And he could just, he could just be, you know, they could have made a skinny Adam. That would make a lot more sense than a jacked Adam that turns into a jacked He-Man. But anyway, he's having some sort of um, contest with Tila, and Man-at-Arms has created these new sleds, and and Adam, who is clumsy because he's, you know, uh, in disguise or whatever, he <clears throat> falls off of the sled and Orko tries to save him, but he messes everything up like he does. And so He-Man sees the, the, the Witch of Grayskull and has to go help. So he takes off and then he turns into He-Man. This, I don't think I've... 
ever seen this in a comic before where there's no border. Has anyone ever seen a no border comic? Is it just missing it? Like, did they, was it going to be a color and it didn't happen? Or so that looks, anybody, whoops, anybody else have a, a comic that has this? Or does anybody have this comic and it, the same thing? I am fascinated by this one panel. It, and it's a, it's a coolly drawn picture. <clears throat> so anyway, He-Man takes off and he, he goes to Grasso Gray Skull to stop Skeletor from using his gauntlets of whatever to dig a tunnel under to get to Castle Grayskull because Grayskull doesn't have um, a basement. It It's just kind of sitting there. But anyway, He-Man says, cut it out. And he shoots his energy blast from his power sword and knocks uh, Skeletor aside. But Skeletor is like, ha, I'll stop you. And he takes uh, the magical witch. He grabs her and he's like, I've got her. What are you going to do now? If you mess with me, I'm going to um, crush her. And that's paraphrasing because I don't think he would ever say crush her in a comic or a kid show like this. So Orko tries to help. And he by using his magic, he has uh, weakened the the world, the magical barrier between Eternia and Etheria. And the big bad guy that Skeletor was afraid of, him and all of his um, toy uh, henchmen, they come back and they basically want to fight. The, and the next, like, till the end of the comic is, is a fight. So we have these different... <clears throat> new toy characters. I don't know if they were actually became toys or or what, but they're supposedly different than Skeletor's henchmen. And but so Skeletor and I can't remember what his name um begins with an H. Anyway, they fight and um and He Man fights the bad guys and they keep going back and forth. They, they show the new... Um, I think he was a toy because he configures and he has two heads and he can configure into a whole bunch of different uh, characters and stuff. And so <clears throat> the big big bad guy's like, me and Skeletor are going to fight while you guys just relax in a, in a prison that I've made. So he beams them all to a prison and um, the bad guys are like, we're going to just stay here. But He-Man says, screw that, I'm getting out of here. So He-Man and Orko and Cringer or Battle Cat or whatever take off and the bad guy, new bad guy toys uh, stay where they are. And so this is kind of a, a funky panel. This is how they decide to show their big combat. Like this is the... I'll get back to that, I guess, when I'm discussing the art. But um, yeah, I'm just not too impressed with this this panel here. So they're fighting back and forth and He-Man gets stuck in the in the stones and this lizard comes and he's going to kill him. Uh, but at the last second, he jumps out of the way and he smashes the stone so He-Man can get free. And then he and Battle Cat take off. But then Orko is trapped by this giant um, tree and Battle Cat swats the tree away, the tree branch away and saves Orko. So they they continue on to the fight that they know is going on between uh, Huron, Huri, Huron, that's the bad guy's name, I guess, and Skeletor. <coughs> and H is winning, and um, Orko, he, because he's there in another dimension, but Orko uses his magic for to open a portal between dimensions, from Etheria to Eternia, and. He Man, Battle Cat, and Orko end up on and um, Eternia, where the fight is going on, and Skeletor is about to get his butt whipped, and He Man comes to save the day, and so does Man at Arms and Tila. So they fight back against the bad guy and stun him, but uh, Skeletor's pissed off that he got saved. And the big bad guy runs away, but he vows vengeance. And Skeletor uh, also runs away, and he also vows vengeance. 
and um, He-Man and his friends are like, we're going to be prepared next time. So, anyway, that's uh, Masters of the Universe number one from Marvel. And I didn't say the writer, right? Written by Mark Carlin. Pencilers was Ron Wilson. Dennis Janke is the anchor. And Janice Chang is the letterer. Bob Sharon is the colorist. But this is one of those um, Marvel comics that the colors are, I can't remember. It's its a different way that they were doing it where the colors were were brighter and the color separation is just wrong. It's off, I think. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, I started reading comics about this time and I was really not impressed by this new coloring technique. I, I am disgusted that it was ever created and um, I just wish it had never been born. Um, the, the color separation is off on so many of these things and it's just uh, like look at the colors for um, Grayskull. It's just not good and I'm, I'm really saddened that so many of these great comics were uh, violated with this color, this new color scheme. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, my memory sucks today, I guess. But anyway, so the writing is, I, I can't judge it too harshly because it is supposed to be, it's supposed to look, feel, sound like the cartoon. And it basically does. There's, there's um, a formula to the story. It's start with some sort of, um, thing that Skeletor does to try to get into Castle Grayskull because that's what he's always trying to do. Um, He-Man is doing some kind of funny thing with either Orko or Cringer or Man-at-Arms or whatever. And He-Man goes off, tries to rescue Grayskull from, because he's the hero of Grayskull, from um, Skeletor. Skeletor is defeated and they do another funny thing. So that's basically the the whole premise of all the shows. And that's basically this comic in a nutshell. And so I can't really say that it's bad. I mean, because it's, it's following the vein of what it wants to do. So in in that, he he succeeds spectacularly because <clears throat> all of the uh, I know all of the characters. I never had to reread any of the lines to figure out what was going on. So. In that manner, it was a success. But, you know, it is what it is. It's no uh, it's no um, great work of art, I guess. It, If you like it, that's cool. That's great. It's awesome. And like I said, it does what it's supposed to do. The art is, is actually quite good. It's, I'm not going to say basic, but it's, or simple, but it, it's, it kind of just shows what it is it doesn't take an artful tact in doing what it's doing it uh it it shows basic forms it's it's not going to um it's not going to sacrifice um what it is for any kind of artistic real artistic value it's going to uh, like there's not going to be a lot of foreshortening. There's not going to be a lot of um, action poses that are are really spectacular. It's not it's not going to be uh, Jack Kirby. It's going to just basically try to show you what is going on in the story, and that's that's perfectly fine. And it's not bad. The line work is nice. The narrative art is pretty good. It's just kind of bland. It's just you know not really doesn't venture out into being anything other than uh, the basic constructs of what it is. And the construct is the the toys, the toys and the cartoons. And they wanted to make a, a comic that was a toy in a cartoon inspired comic. And that's what it is. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's 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 actually pretty cool. I, I really feel like He-Man <clears throat> could be something really spectacular. But they would have to have writers like like maybe if you got Grant Morrison to do a He Man thing, then it would be really spectacular. But or or um, Neil Gaiman or Alan Moore or something like that. It would have to be something really weird and 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 far out for it to diverge so far from the comics and toys and cartoons. But 
I guess they would never do that. They would never damage the um the brand, and that's uh that's what the kids want, I guess, or that's what they wanted, and that's what they they sold as the toys. So anyway, the art is is really pretty good. Uh, nothing spectacular. Uh, like I said, there's not not a lot of foreshortening, and they're trying to they're trying to draw in an almost animationish way. I I feel um, they're they're not trying to do a lot of intricate detail line work, and which is perfectly okay. I, this, like I said, I really like this. I really enjoy this this panel. <clears throat> if this was done now, <coughs> especially if it was done by image or something, it would be. Um, he, you would see, you would have an aerial view probably, and you would really see this sword shooting up at you, and and Battle Cat would be all in the in the background just doing some kind of cool pose. But uh, I think I might actually do a He Man sketch, a uh, warm up sketch before I start doing art today, today, and we'll see how that how that shows up. If you want to check that out, it'd be. Uh, uh, I'd post it on Instagram at Alex Turbin 0441. So, like I said, it's it's pretty it's pretty standard stuff. Uh, this is pretty cool the way they do that. The narrative art is really very good. You you can't this actually is good because you have Battle Cat going this way and He Man going this way, and then you have an establishing shot of Gray Skull. And then you have Skeletor trying to get into the into the castle. Now, normally you might want to have this um, going the other way and facing the other way, but it actually is almost going pointing down to uh, Skeletor and the next page. This you want facing the other way. You don't want it facing that way because you want to get to the next page. You want it all to flow from page to page, from panel to panel, and. So, like I said, I think it would have been better if maybe um, this whole thing was flip-flopped and He-Man was over here and the two images of Skeletor were over here. But that's that's kind of, that's very nitpicky. Uh, everything else is really, really nicely done. There, there's very few backgrounds. I, I kind of wish there were more, but like I said, it's animation-based, so you're not going to have a lot of backgrounds or details. And... The fight scenes are are all are all very basic. I I really kind of don't like these clouds. I think they could have done a lot better with the clouds. I imagine it, it looks like they had th just a basic structure of the clouds, the penciler, and then the anchor just went in and did all of the inking, and um, kind just kind of sloughed it up with his his feathering techniques. And so when they're doing their fights, it's all pretty standard uh, six panel grids. And and it's basically introduce the new toy, have them fight a little bit, and then have a have a resolution. Um, I really like this panel. It's really nice action. You could have done this a lot of different ways. I I probably would have done completely different images and completely different um, figures as he tumbles. But it's it's pretty cool. It can be done either way, and look, that looks really good. I like that. Um, but the only part that I really don't like in this whole book is this. What are they doing? They they could have had their arms stretched out, doing their magical damage, battling it out. But they chose to have some magic coming from their chest and each fighting in the middle. And it's not even a fight in the middle. It's just a blob in the middle. It's it's very, very boring. I, and I even if they had like had um, Skeletor in the foreground and this guy in the background and it was, you know, gave it some depth. That might have even been a little bit better. But that is definitely the weakest part of the comic for me. <clears throat> so anyway, um, that's Masters of the Universe number one by Marvel Comics. And if you guys like this kind of content, please consider subscribing and hitting the no notification bell. And if you guys are into Masters of the Universe, let me know. I'd, I'd like to hear it. And I'd actually like to hear why you love Masters of the Universe so much. Um, but I would give this a rating of a 6. No, I'm going to say a 5. A 5 Due to the the coloring technique that they use on the book is 
is so sloppy and and rough shot and um i'm gonna i'm gonna give it a five if not for that if it had been colored differently i think it would probably would have been a six um but yep so there you go masters of the universe number one by marvel marvel 1986 um and i'll talk to you guys later thanks for watching